Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12 is one of those that has a bit more depth to it than a casual reading of it might suggest. So we're, we're going to get a little technical today to add some background to what it is we're going to read. You know, one of the unsatisfactory, even risky results of divesting the Apostle Paul from his Jewishness and his, his high level of Jewish religious education at the elite rabbinical academy of Gamaliel is that when we read his words, we lose not just the all-important context, but we even lose the tone and, the, and what his deeply ingrained worldview is. That is, who he is, where he came from. Um, and within institutional Christianity, it's implied, really sometimes it's outright stated, that Paul is essentially a Jew who, because of Christ, now identifies as more of a Gentile. And when we read his epistles, he's making it all up as he goes. That is, he is essentially inventing Christianity, and he's establishing church doctrine on the fly in the same way that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone and then designed the first telephone network starting with a blank sheet of paper. In other words, something new was created where it had never before existed, not even in concept. Just as Bell created the Manual of Telephony, so did Paul create the Manual of Christianity. Now, while I've endeavored at several points to show you how that is not at all the case, I'm going to show you in yet another way why this erroneous platform for understanding Paul needs to be replaced with a reality that ought to have been self-evident even before something near hard proof has emerged. Now the main source I'll use comes from the Essen community of Jews who about 150 years before Christ separated themselves from regular Jewish society primarily because they felt that the priesthood and the institutional temple system had become completely corrupt and wicked. Since they saw the Torah ordained temple and priesthood as that molten core of worship of the God of Israel, they went off to prepare themselves as a new order of priests that would eventually replace the corrupt priesthood as it currently existed, and then they would restore the temple and the priesthood to its God-intended purity. Now, my effort to help to restore Paul more closely to his actual self will also involve the great series of documents that the Essens wrote that are collectively known to us as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, most Christians think of the Dead Sea Scrolls as but the Bible copied and written down in Hebrew by this strange Dead Sea sect around 100 BC. And the great news about finding the treasure trove of documents in the mid-1940s is that it proved just how faithfully the Old Testament has been preserved and handed down over the centuries so we can trust what we have in our Bibles today. But in fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls is much more than only copied books of the Old Testament. It also contains the theology, the philosophy, and the community rules for the essence that were recorded quite meticulously. Well, after being discovered in some caves near the Dead Sea in Israel, the scrolls were controlled for decades by a small group 
of scholars, and only fairly recently have they been released for public consumption. And as researchers around the world have poured over these ancient documents, it's become clear that our modern view of the New Testament, and therefore of the writers who wrote these various books, were going to be affected. More so in some cases, less so in other cases. And to be clear, some of these scrolls were written as much as two centuries before the Gospels were written and before the letters of the New Testament were first penned and well more than three centuries before the Gospels and letters were then collected and turned into what we today call a New Testament. So of course, any remnant of any New Testament document uh, was not found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. They, that, they represent an earlier time, the scrolls do. Nevertheless, because of what was found, Paul and his epistles especially were going to have to be rethought, not because of any errors in biblical manuscripts, but because of errors in interpreting Paul's meaning, in understanding his perspective, even Paul's sources for some of his thoughts. However, the response of the many mainstream Christian denominations around the world, whether of Western Christianity, Catholicism, Eastern Orthodox, Slavic, Coptic, any other, has generally been muted, to say the least. Why? Well, probably because while the scholars and academics <clears throat> that represent these denominations are gleefully excited over the new information that these documents are giving to them, and they're open to its significance. For the various church governments, it feels more like an unwelcome threat to the carefully guarded status quo. Is this sense of threat because the contents of the Dead Sea Scrolls in any way contests or calls to question our faith in Yeshua of Nazareth as Messiah? No. Does it in any way contest or call to question the Holy Scriptures and their reliability? No. What the Dead Sea Scrolls does contest and call to question are the beliefs and the motives and even the theology of Judaism in that era and where the ideas that especially Paul presents in his many letters, where they originally came from. Were those ideas entirely fresh from his own mind, those ones we read? Or were they from divine inspiration by the risen Yeshua? Or where exactly did they come from? Ideas that to the Gentile early church fathers seem so new, so innovative, that it caused the church for the past 1800 years to see less and less use for the Old Testament. And as we're going to soon find out, many of those supposed new and original thoughts of Paul were already in existence. They were already being taught. They were already being practiced within the Essen community and known to the broader Jewish community more than 100 years before Yeshua, 150 years before Paul, often using the exact same terminology that Paul is found to be using to explain some of his theology. In fact, Yeshua employed some of those essence terms. Coincidence? Hardly. So why does church government in general seem so disinterested in what these documents reveal? Because it puts a different face on the meaning of Paul's words at times. And it more completely describes what the true nature of Jewishness and Judaism at that time looked like. And it reinforces this unmistakable 
Jewish nature and source of the New Testament concepts and information. So, open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it is page 1416. <coughs> Romans chapter 12. I exhort you, therefore, brothers, in view of God's mercies, to offer yourselves as a sacrifice, living and set apart for God. This will please him. It's the logical temple worship for you. In other words, don't let yourselves be conformed to the standards of the olam haze, present world. Instead, keep letting yourselves be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you will know what God wants. You will agree what he wants is good, satisfying, and able to succeed. For I'm telling every single one of you through the grace that's been given to me, not to exaggerate ideas about your own importance. Instead, develop a sober estimate of yourself based on the standard which God has given to each of you, namely, trust. For just as there are many parts that compose one body, but the parts don't all have the same function, so there are many of us and in union with the Messiah, we comprise one body, with each of us belonging to the others. But we have gifts that differ, which are meant to be used according to the grace that has been given to us. If your gift is prophecy, use it to the extent of your trust. If it's serving, use it to serve. If you're a teacher, use your gift in teaching. If you're a counselor, use your gift to comfort and exhort. If you're someone who gives, do it simply and generously. If you're in a position of leadership, lead with diligence and zeal. If you're one who does acts of mercy, do them cheerfully. Don't let love be a mere outward show. Recoil from what's evil. Cling to what's good. Love each other devotedly with brotherly love. Set examples for each other in showing respect. Don't be lazy when hard work's needed, but serve the Lord with spiritual fervor. Rejoice in your hope. Be patient in your troubles and continue steadfastly in prayer. Share what you have with God's people. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless them. Don't curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be sensitive to each other's needs. Don't think of yourselves better than others, but make humble people your friends. Don't be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but try to do what everyone regards as good. And if possible, to the extent it depends on you, live in peace with all people. Never seek revenge, my friends. Instead, leave that to God's anger. For in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, it is written, Adonai says, vengeance is my responsibility. I'll repay. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing this, you will heap fiery coals of shame on his head. Do not be conquered by evil. Conquer evil with good. You know, chapters 1 through 11 of Romans accomplished several things. First of all, they had Paul attempting to assert his authority over the believing congregation in the city of Rome as the Christ-chosen apostle to the Gentiles. Now, understand, he's doing this long distance, a first so far as we know, since he had never been to Rome. So, he had no hand in organizing that particular congregation or teaching it 
his doctrine. Second of all, in keeping with the protocol of his several other letters to various congregations, he is writing to the Romans about matters that he perceives directly concern them. He must have heard some things about the Roman congregation that he felt needed his attention, so he wrote to them. The rather standard Christian position is that in Romans, Paul is creating a brand new Christian systematic theology, and then he's presenting it to the Roman believers almost like a trial run. Now, I don't buy this, and thankfully, many modern New Testament scholars don't either. Third, Paul has been setting the foundation and the purpose for God's inclusion of Gentiles into what was otherwise but a rather new branch of Judaism, a branch that worshiped Yeshua as Lord and Savior. Now, Paul, of course, saw this Gentile inclusion as membership into the kingdom of God and into the body of the elect that up to now had consisted solely of Jews. So chapter 12 begins a new direction now in Paul's letter. To use more familiar church language, Paul was moving from theory to application. But from the more apropos Jewish perspective, and especially from that of a trained rabbi like Paul, Paul was going to draw out some halakot, Jewish religious rulings that the Jewish and Gentile believers of Rome should follow based, based all on what Paul had, had taught them in the 11 previous chapters. Now this new focus of chapter 12 is going to continue until about midway through Romans chapter 15. Verse 1. When Paul says he exhorts, he urges the Romans to do a certain thing, this is Paul exercising his authority as an apostle. His intent would have been understood by the letter recipients. Now, whether some or all of the believers of Rome would have accepted his authority that he claims, that's a whole other matter. And from what we find in the book of Acts, when a few years later, he found himself in Rome, but as a prisoner in chains, the implication is that not much of the Roman congregation had accepted Paul's authority over him, over them. The challenging issue of verse 1 is what Paul means when he speaks about the need for the Roman believers to offer themselves up to God as a sacrifice, living and set apart for the Lord. But even more, what does he mean when he continues that being a sacrifice is the logical temple worship for these Roman believers? Now, the complete Jewish Bible is the only one that states it quite that way. More typical is like we see in the King James Version. There, Romans 12, 1 sounds like this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Or, as the NAS version states it, I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable God, which is your spiritual service of worship. However, in the original Greek, neither the term spiritual nor worship is actually there. In fact, including the word spiritual practically turns the impact of this portion of the verse on its head. The key Greek word near the end of this sentence is logikos. Logikos. As you might already be guessing, this is where we get the English word logic. And indeed, logikos means reason or logic. However, this logic then pertains to the following Greek word, latreia. Latreia. 
latreia, which means a service of some kind that is about something religious. So it's a religious service. So this difficult phrase means something like the logical service of worship. The logical service of worship. Okay. So here I believe is the point. Paul is saying that by making ourselves like a sacrifice to God, living and holy, that this is the intelligent, logical, reason-based response to becoming a believer. I hope you hear that. It's not about a feeling. Offering ourselves up to God is not an ecstatic response. It's not an emotional response. It shouldn't be a knee-jerk reaction. Rather, knowing what we now know about Yeshua and about redemption means it's the perfectly logical thing for any thinking believer to do to offer ourselves up to God as a sacrifice. Our response of salvation needs to begin in our mind. Saying it in the negative, kind of turning this upside down, would be not becoming a sacrifice living and holy to God would defy any normal, intelligent, human response to receiving such a great gift. However, slicing that onion a little thinner, what does Paul mean by the phrase, a sacrifice living and holy? Now, some versions have rearranged the word order from the Greek to give us a living and holy sacrifice. In other words, the sacrifice, us, remains alive and we gain holiness. Now, that would be fine except it ignores how the sacrificial system worked. Clearly, the way the complete Jewish Bible says it is much closer to what Paul had in mind because the logical service, logical religious service, refers to the religious services that take place at the temple, just as the sacrifice also refers to actions that can take place only at the temple. I mean, see, we need to take this in its natural, entirely Jewish context. Where else than the temple can a Jew offer religious service? What else to a Jew is a sacrifice except a living creature that is given to God as an offering of atonement at the holy temple and then placed upon the holy altar. This is not some generalized, universal, or Gentile-oriented statement that Paul has made. Paul is making use of metaphor, just as he regularly does. He does not literally mean for a believer to go to the temple and throw himself on the altar as a human sacrifice. But the setting and the motif of Paul's metaphor is, of course, the Jerusalem temple and the sacrificial laws of Moses. So what of the underlying concept of a living and holy sacrifice? Well, first, this is nothing new. All temple, hear this, all temple sacrifices are first presented to God, living and holy. Dead animals are not presented to God. They are given to him first as alive. Only shortly before they're burned up on the altar are they killed. From the moment they are given by the worshiper, the moment they are even selected out of the flock or the herd for sacrifice, they instantly become set apart as God's holy property. I want to say something before, that it, before you that it, at first might not seem this apparent. Paul regularly uses the temple system as the underlying subject of his many metaphors. But he's not the only New Testament writer that does this. 
Peter does it too. In 1 Peter 2.9. You are, you, but you are a chosen people, the gods, uh, rather, the king's priests, a holy nation, a people for God to possess. Why? In order for you to declare the praises of the one who called you out of the darkness into the wonderful life. Or you are a little more used to hearing it like this from the NAS, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood a holy nation, a people called for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. A royal priesthood. In numerous places in the New Testament, believers are called priests. But for the most part, this is metaphor. Because biblically, biblically priests can only be Levites. But what mental image is this metaphor meant to conjure up? Well, it's the image of the temple. It's the image of temple services that happen. Since the underlying subject of the metaphor is the holy temple and its ritual services that must be performed by Levitical priests. You can't get much more Jewish than that. So indeed, Paul spent a great deal of time Speaking about believers dying to themselves, dying to ourselves, in earlier chapters of Romans, didn't he? And like Christ, we are to voluntarily die, in our case, die to our sin, die to our former ways. Thus, the sacrificial altar at the Holy Temple is the backdrop for Paul's concept as the place or where believers are to die to ourselves. But only after presenting to our, uh, ourselves to God, living and holy, as with any sacrifice. So believers, this is not a new concept that Paul is expressing. And even more, the essence thought the same way. One and a half centuries before Paul. Here's an excerpt from Dead Sea Scroll 1QS5. Now, I'm only going to partially quote it for time's sake. And this is the rule for the members of the community. For those who volunteer to be converted from all evil and to cling to all his commandments according to his will, to separate themselves from the congregation of perverse men, to become a community in the law, they shall practice truth humility and righteousness and justice and loving charity. But in the community, they shall circumcise in the foreskin of the evil inclination and of disobedience in order to lay a foundation of truth for Israel, for the community of the everlasting covenant, that they may atone, it could be a sacrifice, for all who are volunteers for the holiness of Aaron. In other words, for the priesthood. So we see the essence of course, use the temple, the temple motif that underlies their metaphor. And when they speak of atoning, it's the same thing as Paul, who just uses the word sacrifice instead, living and holy, because the purpose of an animal sacrifice is what? Atonement. So temple service is what righteous men do logically. And yet, we are confronted with this irony that both the essence and Paul noted. The logical, rational thing for a man made righteous by trust in God is his spiritual worship of God. Today, as it's been since the European Enlightenment of the early 18th century, Logic and spirit are seen as mutually exclusive concepts. They can't be spoken of in the same sentence. In fact, logic and reason replace spirit and inspiration. To be spiritual is not logical, it is thought, and vice versa. This is the basis of secular humanism. Paul continues the concept of the logical, rational mind 
being the location where spiritual renewal takes place in verse 2. And the ruling from Paul is very straightforward. If you want to agree with God and please Him, then you must turn away from the standards of this world that have always been your standards until you believed. Because until then, you were part of the world. Here's the point Paul is making. Since renewal begins in your mind, then you have to make the correct mental decisions. You have to make the right choices. Now that we're saved and we have the Holy Spirit in us, it is our responsibility to consciously make different choices than we used to make before we knew Yeshua. We must think before we act. We must cease acting, frankly, instinctively. Because our instincts are of this world. Of course, as Paul pointed out back in Romans chapter 7, humans are caught in a conundrum when it comes to choice and behavior. Back in Romans 7, 15 through 20, you don't have to turn there, but here's what Paul said. I don't understand my own behavior. I don't do what I want to do. Instead, I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I'm doing what I don't want to do, I'm agreeing that the Torah is good. But now it's no longer the real me doing it. It's the sin housed inside of me. For I, I know there's nothing good housed inside of me. That is my old nature. I can want what's good. I just can't do it. For I don't do the good I want. Instead, the evil I don't want is what I do. But if I'm doing what the real me doesn't want, it's no longer the real me doing it. It's the sin housed inside of me. And he ends this by crying out his frustration. He says, what a miserable creature I am. Who's going to rescue me from this body that's bound for death? Thanks be to God, he will. Through Yeshua, our Messiah, our, our Lord, to sum it up with my mind, I'm a slave to God's Torah, but with my old nature, I'm a slave of, God, of sin's Torah. Listen again. With my mind, Paul says, I am a slave to God's Torah, but with my old nature, my instincts, I'm a slave of sin's So this is kind of a good news, bad news situation for believers, isn't it? The bad news is, although we're saved, gee, we still live in this world with all of its pulls and its temptations and reminders of our past, of our past lives. The good news is we're no longer helpless victims of our evil inclination that keep us bound to this world. There's, a now, there's now a power in us, the power of the Holy Spirit to help us overcome. However, we can't just go take a nap and leave it to the Holy Spirit to do all the work. That would be great. You know, kind of like that subliminal learning thing. You don't go to school, you just put a little speaker and a tape under your pillow, right? See, we have to put this new reality into actual practice. Being aware that it's going to be hard and not easy, and it's going to begin with conscious choices. It means fighting our knee-jerk reactions, not following them. See, the problem that any psychologist or counselor will tell you is that it's human nature want approval from our peers. And there will be a constant pressure on us to conform to whatever the societal norms might be. A popular term for this today is political correctness. So in verse 3, Paul commands, he creates a religious ruling, that no one should exaggerate their own importance, but rather 
Can you guys stop cracking up back there? You're making me crazy up here. <laughs> I'm out Gary and Gary tonight. There we go. No one should exaggerate their own importance, but rather should view oneself by the standard that God uses. And guess what that standard is? Trust in his son. That's the standard. When Paul says, through the grace that has been given to me, he is speaking about grace as the position of authority that the Lord has graciously, graciously given to him. He's speaking about his being an apostle. Now, most other versions of the Bible than the complete Jewish Bible give this verse a different meaning. The NAS says this, For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. That's very different. What does the phrase measure of faith mean to us? If we take the way the NAS, and frankly, most other English versions of it as well, it means measure in the sense of amount or quantity. That is, God has allotted to us, each of us, a certain amount of faith. A big helping or a little helping. And since what a believer can do is based, we're told, on the quantity of faith we have, then those who God has given a large amount of faith ought to be able to do miracles, and those whom God has given a little tiny bit of faith can do next to nothing. If this is the case, brotherly unity among believers becomes exceedingly difficult, if not impossible especially in light of what's being said in the following verses about how we are each a different part of the same body and we must not think that our part is any better than another and different part. So this idea of faith being measured in terms of quantity or amount cannot possibly be what Paul has in mind. Rather, the term measure of faith is better expressed in English as standard of faith. The standard of faith. One legitimate definition of the word measure, if you look it up in a dictionary, is standard. But the modern English language doesn't use the word measure that way very much. What is the standard of faith that God measures us by? Trust. So says Paul, we need to evaluate, evaluate ourselves honestly to see where we are on God's trust scale. We shouldn't deceive ourselves about ourselves. Our trust in Yeshua is the measure by which God views us and deals with us. This has a lot of bearing now on what he says next. So now that Paul has explained the preliminaries, he's going to install general guidelines that believers, Jews and Gentiles, are to follow as members of the believing community. He is essentially following the same pattern of community building that we find the essence used, just as they recorded it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now remember, while for us, all that remains of the essence are the Dead Sea Scrolls, for Paul, the essence community was current. Essence walked among the people of the Holy Land. They were long established, a live, thriving Jewish community. They were well known, they were well accepted, very influential actually, among the common folks, hated by the priesthood. And they were admired among the theologians of Judaism, like Paul. So not surprisingly, he approaches setting out Community rules for the Messianic community, very similarly to how the Essens did it. So the first community principle that Paul must establish is that while everyone is equal spiritually in God's eyes, 
Not everybody has been given the same abilities or purpose. Thus, using the metaphor of the human body, that there is not one part of the body that you can say is more valuable than another, all parts of the body are needed to achieve wholeness. Even so, each part is for a different purpose. They can't all be the same or perform the same function, but here's the crux. All the many parts must understand that they are there for the well-being of the entire body. That's their overriding purpose. Each member of a body is there for the well-being of the entire body. Some parts may have more visibility. So maybe they get more attention, might even get more credit than other parts. Some parts may get the dirty work, while other parts seem to get all the glory. And in the body of Christ, even one more step of complexity exists. Some parts will be Jews, other parts will be Gentiles, so the possibility of jealously, a jealousy, cultural misunderstanding, and the want of dominance is a clear and present danger at all times. However, if community unity is Christ-centered, not self-centered, then it can all work properly. If we see ourselves as belonging to the others of the community, then our function will not rate ourselves basing on our personal sense of importance, but rather on how well we achieve our particular purpose that's for the good of the entire body. It's a matter of perspective. In verse 6, we again see the rather unique way that Paul uses the term grace when he says that gifts are going to differ. And they're meant to be used according to the grace given to each person. Now, grace in this instance is that term grace is used by Paul to almost mean the substance of the, that particular gift. That is, the grace is the nature of that gift to believers, just as for Paul, the grace he happened to receive was the apostolic authority that he'd been given. But now Paul begins to list some of these gifts that are usually called in Western Christian circles spiritual gifts. Now, some think that the order that Paul lists them indicates the order of importance that God sees them. That is, that they are listed from greater gifts to lesser gifts. I disagree with that. There's nothing in his words that indicates such a thing. I mean, why the order he chooses? There's nothing to indicate it. Might there be a lesser and greater gift in God's eyes? I mean, it's possible. However, on the other hand, it would sort of go against Paul's thought that while all parts of the body are equal, they will also be different with none more valuable than the other. So to set the spiritual gifts now in a pecking order of value or importance in the next verse seems to be a complete conflict with what he just said. So I don't think there's any order of importance. So without assigning value or importance, here are the gifts. Prophecy, serving, teaching, counseling, giving, leading, and doing acts of mercy. Now in the New Testament, prophecy most often, most often means discerning and explaining Scripture. That's what it means in the New Testament. In other words, in what scripture are we talking about? Old Testament scripture. However, in this case, since prophecy and teaching are listed as two separate gifts, then prophecy must mean something else. If we take prophecy as meaning something a little closer to revelation, that's probably the better idea. That is, prophets in the Old Testament were generally directly attached to specific kings of Israel. And they heard directly from God, and they delivered God's oracles to Israel's kings. 
they were often given the ability to see in the future. Or better, they were given information about the future. There is no such claim to this in the New Testament, except perhaps in kind of an offhanded way by John in the book of Revelation. However, there is still inspiration and revelation of already existing truths all right, that until now had not been correctly understood or not even fully revealed. So in this sense, Paul could be said to have this gift of prophecy. In fact, since Judaism is the cultural backdrop for the New Testament, it is good for you to know that about a half century before Paul's day, the sages had declared that prophecy as it was known and practiced in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, had come to a halt. But just a few years later, the rabbis shifted and they claimed that they were, that they, the rabbis, were the new prophets. However, they too meant it more in the sense of revealing truth, not so much in seeing the future. Paul's era, you see, was a time of transition as regards how prophecy was thought of. Rabbis once again believed that Old Testament style prophecy was now still possible, and yet exactly what that amounted to would differ according to different rabbis. Thus we see in the New Testament a very fuzzy definition of the word prophecy and the use of that term that depending on the writer, depending on the character, depending on the situation, it could mean anything from merely teaching scripture all the way up to bringing in a new oracle from the Lord, even in a limited sense, seeing into the future. Now the gift of serving is more meant in the realm of service. Service. And service is meant in the realm of temple worship. Not like doing a good deed of washing your elderly neighbor's windows, which if somebody wants to talk to me about that, I'd be happy to have that done. <clears throat> this service would include things like prayer teaching about the Torah, making financial contributions to the temple, maybe to the synagogue, and doing everything generously and without seeking compensation. So service is meant entirely in the religious sense, not in the humanitarian sense. The gift of teaching was center stage in Paul's era. The purpose of a teacher was to instruct others on how to walk in the ways of God. The reference material for a teacher was Holy Scripture. And his job was not to add to it, make bold predictions from it, but rather it was to show people how to know God's will and to another extent, how to make application of it. Interestingly, the most revered person in the community of the Essens was called the Teacher of Righteousness. That was his title, the Teacher of Righteousness. And I think for us to better understand the office of teacher in Second Temple Judaism, in other words, Paul's era and Christ's era, it's good to hear from the Essens Teacher of Righteousness himself. Taken from the Dead Sea Scrolls 1QH, the teacher of righteousness is recorded as saying this, And thou hast created for me thy sake to fulfill the law, and to teach by my mouth the men of thy counsel in the midst of the sons of men, that thy marvels may be told to everlasting generations, and thy mighty deeds be contemplated without end. And all the nations shall know thy truth, all the peoples thy glory. For thou hast caused them to enter thy glorious covenant with all the men of thy counsel, and into a common lot with the angels of the face, and none shall treat with insolence the sons. And they shall be converted by thy glorious mouth, and shall be thy princes in the lot of light. 
So the teacher of the office of teacher was purely about teaching God's word and fulfilling the law of Moses by teaching it to others so that God's marvels and his mighty deeds will be known forever. And the hope is that all the nations, meaning Gentiles, will hear of it and they will revere the God of Israel. I mean, doesn't that sound exactly like Paul's purpose as the apostle to the Gentiles? And of Christ's personal exhortation to believers in the New Testament. And speaking of exhortation, the term counselor, as used in verse 8, has much to do with exhortation. In fact, to again inject the Jewish perspective into this, that Paul would of course have had, a person who exhorted was a counselor or a preacher. Now these two terms were generally synonymous in that era. A counselor was a person who gave sermons and he dealt more with life questions like why do bad things happen to good people? The nature of morality. And they kept the stories of Israel's great heroes alive and they would speak about what proper justice is and when vengeance is warranted and when it's not and so on and so forth. Very topical. A preacher or a counselor did not teach God's holy scriptures exegetically. And especially, they did not teach exegetically on the Torah, the law of Moses. That privilege belonged to the office of teacher. Now I want to pause for a moment for you to notice something critical in everything I've told you today. I've told you before that there were parallel religious systems operating within Judaism in Paul's day that the people then just took for granted. The temple and the synagogue. Two entirely separate systems. All of these offices and jobs and gifts were thought of by Paul as operating within the definitions and the rules of the synagogue system led by the rabbis, not within the temple system as overseen by the priests. And while the temple system was still venerated for the purpose of biblical feasts and appointed times and sacrificing, the priesthood, especially the high priest, well, he was no longer trusted. And in fact, he earned the title, they all, the priesthood earned the title of sons of darkness from the essence. So while temple imagery is used, especially by Paul in the several metaphors he, he employs in his writings, this is not to be confused with thinking that Paul had any more to do with that system than did any other typical Jew. The typical Jew was tied to the synagogue system. So the gift of giving now, that's pretty straightforward, and while it certainly includes supporting the temple and the synagogue, it just as easily including, included being hospitable to strangers, and this was a very high uh, value, a very high virtue uh, within the social system of the Middle East, even to this day. Now the gift of leading can be mainly seen as a task that fell to Israel's elders. Elders in this era also had another name applied to them. They were called overseers. And included in this gift category was the president of, of, of the synagogue. And his task was to find speakers and assure the maintenance of the synagogue building and, and he would serve on other elder boards. It also included presiding over meetings. Leading was not meant in a political sense, nor was it meant in any official government capacity. It too was meant leading within the religious realm. Now, it's difficult to find 
what was in the Jewish mind of a, of a person who did acts of mercy, especially if it is seen as a special spiritual gift. What they're getting at with this is kind of hard to figure out. It's my position that this is not meant to be a job a person did. It's not an office like a teacher or a prophet. Rather, it is more a highly revered character trait, I think. A character trait that all believers should desire to have rather than being construed mostly as a separate gifting. But the main point Paul makes about doing acts of mercy, meaning charity, is to always do it cheerfully as opposed to doing it grudgingly or as little as possible but still maintaining a good reputation in front of your peers. Well, since this ends the special section about gifts, I think we'll stop here and we'll continue with the remainder of chapter 12 next time. Thank you.